Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Reading Corner with Moose Changer Pat. That's me, in case you're wondering. Today, we're reading Chapter 9 of Queen of Sorcery, and as always, you should buy the original book to support the original work. Chapter 9. The wind picked up again shortly before dawn and was blowing briskly by the time the sky over the low foothills to the east began to lighten. Garion was numb with exhaustion by then, and his mind had drifted into an almost dreamlike trance. The faces of his companions all seemed strange to him as the pale light began to grow stronger. At times, he even forgot why they rode. He seemed caught in a company of grim-faced strangers pounding along a road to nowhere through a bleak, featureless landscape, with their wind-whipped cloaks flying dark behind them like the clouds scuttling low and dirty overhead. A peculiar idea began to take hold of him. The strangers were somehow his captors, and they were taking him away from his real friends. The idea seemed to grow stronger the further they rode, and he began to be afraid. Suddenly, without knowing why, he wheeled his horse and broke away, plunging off the side of the road and across the open field beside it. Garion! A woman's voice called sharply from behind, but he set his heels to his horse's flanks and sped even faster through the rough field. One of them was chasing him, a frightening man in black leather with a shaved head and a dark lock at his crown flowing behind him in the wind. In a panic, Garion kicked at his horse, trying to make the beast run even faster, but the fearsome rider behind him closed the gap quickly and seized the reins from his hands. What are you doing? he demanded harshly. Garion stared at him, unable to answer. Then the woman in the blue cloak was there, and the others not far behind her. She dismounted quickly and stood looking at him with a stern face. She was tall for a woman, and her face was cold and imperious. Her hair was very dark, and there was a single white lock at her brow. Garion trembled. The woman made him terribly afraid. Get down off that horse, she commanded. Gently, Paul, a silvery-haired old man with an evil face said. A huge, red-bearded giant rode closer, threatening, and Garion, almost sobbing with fright, slid down from his horse. Come here, the woman ordered. Falteringly, Garion approached her. Give me your hand, she said. Hesitantly, he lifted his hand and she took his wrist firmly. She opened his fingers to reveal the ugly mark on his palm that he seemed to always have hated, and then put his hand against the white lock in her hair. Aunt Paul, he gasped, the nightmare suddenly dropping away. She put her arms about him tightly and held him for some time. Strangely, he was not even embarrassed by that display of affection in front of the others. This is serious, father, she told Mr. Wolf. What happened, Garion? Wolf asked, his voice calm. I don't know, Garion replied. It, I was as if I didn't know any of you, and you were my enemies, and all I wanted to do was run away to try to get back to my real friends. Are you still wearing the amulet I gave you? Yes. Have you had it off any time since I gave it to you? Just once, Garion admitted, when I took a bath in the Tolnedrin hostel. Wolf sighed. You can't take it off, he said. Not ever, not for any reason. Take it out from under your shirt. Garion drew out the silver pendant and the strange eh, with the strange design on it. The old man took a medallion out from under his own tunic. It was very bright, and there was upon it the figure of a standing wolf so lifelike that it looked almost ready to lope away. Aunt Paul, her own arm still about Garion's shoulders, drew a similar amulet out of her bodice. Upon the disc of her medallion was the figure of an owl. Hold it in your right hand, dear, she instructed, firmly closing Garion's fingers over the pendant. Then, holding her amulet in her own right hand, she placed her left hand over his closed fist. Wolf, also holding his talisman, put his hands on theirs. Garion's palm began to tingle as if the pendant were suddenly alive. Mr. Wolf and Aunt Paul looked at each other for a long moment, and the tingling in Garion's hand suddenly became very strong. His mind seemed to open and strange things flickered before his eyes. He saw a round room very high up somewhere. A fire burned, but there was no wood in it. 
At a table there was seated an old man who looked somewhat like Mr. Wolf, but obviously was someone else. He seemed to be looking directly at Garion, and his eyes were kindly, even affectionate. Garion was suddenly overwhelmed with a consuming love for the old man. That should be enough, Wolf judged, releasing Garion's hand. Who was that old man? Garion asked. My master, Wolf replied. What happened? Dernick asked, his voice, his face concerned. It's probably better not to talk about it, Aunt Paul said. Do you think you could build a fire? It's a time for breakfast. There are some trees over there where we can get out of the wind, Dernick suggested. They all remounted and rode towards the trees. After they had eaten, they sat by the small fire for a while. They were tired, and none of them felt quite up to facing the blustery morning again. Garion felt particularly exhausted, and he wished that he were young enough to sit close beside Aunt Paul and perhaps to put his head in her lap and sleep as he had done when he was very young. The strange thing that had happened made him feel very much alone and more than a little frightened. Dernick, he said more to drive the mood away than out of any real curiosity, what sort of bird is that? He pointed. A raven, I think, Dernick answered, looking at the bird circling above them. I thought so too, Garion said. But they don't usually circle, do they? Dernick frowned. Maybe it's watching something on the ground. How long has it been up there? Wolf asked, squinting up at the large bird. I think I first saw it when we were crossing the field, Garion told him. Mr. Wolf glanced over at Aunt Paul. What do you think? She looked up from one of Garion's stockings she had been mending. I'll see. Her vo face took on a strange, probing expression. Garion felt a peculiar tingling again. On an impulse, he tried to push his own mind out toward the bird. Garion, Aunt Paul said without looking at him, stop that. I'm sorry, he apologized quickly and pulled his mind back where it belonged. Mr. Wolf looked at him with a strange expression, then winked at him. It's Chamdar, Aunt Paul announced calmly. She carefully pushed her needle into the stocking and set it aside. Then she stood up and shook off her blue cloak. What have you got in mind? Wolf asked. I think I'll go have a little chat with him, she replied, flexing her fingers like talons. You'd never catch him, Wolf told her. Your feathers are too soft for this kind of wind. There's an easier way. The old man swept the windy sky with a searching gaze. Over there, he pointed at a barely visible speck above the hills to the west. You'd better do it, Paul. I don't get along with birds. Of course, father, she agreed. She looked intently at the speck, and Garion felt the tingle as she sent her mind out again. The speck began to circle, rising higher and higher until it disappeared. The raven did not see the plummeting eagle until the last instant, just before the large bird's talons struck. There was a sudden puff of black feathers, and the raven, screeching with fright, flapped wildly away with the eagle in pursuit. Nicely done, Paul, Wolf approved. It will give him something to think about, she smiled. Don't stare, Dernick. Dernick was gaping at her, his mouth open. How did you do that? Do you really want to know? she asked. Dernick shuddered and looked away quickly. I think that just about settles it, Wolf said. Disguises are probably useless now. I'm not sure what Shamdar's up to, but he's going to be watching us every step of the way. We might as well arm ourselves and ride straight on to Vo Mimber. Aren't we going to follow the trail anymore? Barak asked. The trail goes south, Wolf replied. I can pick it up again once we cross over into Tal Nidra. But first, I want to stop by and have a word with King Corridolin. There are things he needs to know. Corridolin? Dernick asks, puzzled. Wasn't that the name of the first Arendish king? It seems to me s somebody told me that once. All Arendish kings are named Corridolin, Silk told him, and the queens are all named Maeserana. Maeserana? Maeserana. It's part of the fiction the royal family here maintains to keep the kingdoms from flying apart. They have to marry as closely within the bloodline as possible to maintain the illusion of the unification of the houses of Mimber and Asturia. It makes them all a bit sickly, but there's no help for it, considering the peculiar nature of Arendish politics. 
All right, Silk, Aunt Paul said reprovingly. Mandarolin looked thoughtful. Could it be that this Chamda, who so dogs our steps, is one of the great substance in the dark society of the Grollums? he asked. He'd like to be, Wolf answered. Zedar and Katuchix are Torak's disciples, and Shamdar wants to be one as well. He's always been Katuchik's agent, but he may believe that is his chance to move up in the Grollum hierarchy. Katuchik's very old, and he spends all his time in the temple of Torak at Rakathal. Maybe Chamdar thinks it's time that someone else became high priest. Is Torak's body at Rakathal? Silk asked quickly. Mr. Wolf shrugged. Nobody knows for sure, but I doubt it. After Zedar carried him away from the battlefield at Vo Member, I don't think he'd have just handed him over to Katuchik. He could be in Maloria or somewhere in the southern reaches of Cathal Murgos, it's hard to say. But at the moment, Chamdar is the one we have to worry about, Silk concluded. Not if we keep moving, Wolf told him. We'd better get moving then, Beric said, standing up. By mid-morning, the heavy clouds had begun to break up, and patches of blue sky showed here and there. Enormous pillars of sunlight stalked ponderously across the rolling fields that waited, damp and expectant, for the first touches of spring. With Mandorlin in the lead, they had ridden hard and had covered a good six leagues. Finally, they slowed to a walk to allow their steaming horses to rest. How much farther is it to Vomimber, Grandfather? Garin asked, pulling his horse in beside Mr. Wolf. Sixty leagues, at least, Wolf answered, probably closer to eighty. That's a long way, Garin winced as he shifted in his saddle. Yes. I'm sorry I ran away like that back there, Garin apologized. It wasn't your fault. Chamdar was playing games. Why did he pick me? Couldn't he have done the same thing to Dernick or Beric? Mr. Wolf looked at him. You're younger, more susceptible. That's not really it, is it? Garin accused. No, Wolf admitted, not really, but it's an answer of sorts. This is another one of those things you aren't going to tell me, isn't it? I suppose you could say that, Wolf answered blandly. Gary insulted about that for a while, but Mr. Wolf rode on, seemingly unconcerned by the boy's reproachful silence. They stopped that night at a Talnedrin hostel, which, like all of them, was plain, adequate, and expensive. The next morning, the sky had cleared except for billowy patches of white clouds scampering before the brisk wind. The sight of the sun made them all feel better, and there was... Even some bantering between Silk and Beric as they rode along, something Garion hadn't heard in all the weeks they'd spent traveling under the gloomy skies of northern Arendia. Mandorlin, however, scarcely spoke that morning, and his face grew more somber with each passing mile. He was not wearing his armor, but instead a male shirt and a deep blue surcoat. His head was bare, and the wind tucked at his cur tugged at his curly hair. On a nearby hilltop, a bleak-looking castle brooded down at them as they passed, its grim walls high and haughty-looking. Mandorlin seemed to avoid looking at it, and his face became even more melancholy. Garion found it difficult to make up his mind about Mandorlin. He was honest enough with himself to admit that much of his thinking was still clad by Leldoran's prejudices. He didn't really want to like Mandorlin, but aside from the habitual gloominess which seemed characteristic of all errands, and the studied and involuted archaism of the man's speech and his towering self-confidence, there seemed little actually to dislike. A half-league along the road from the castle, a ruin sat at the top of a long rise. It was not much more than a single wall with a high archway in the center, and broken columns on either side. Near the ruin, a woman sat on horseback, her dark red cape flowing in the wind. Without a word, almost without seeming to think about it, Mandorlin took his war horse from the road and cantered up the rise toward the woman, who watched his approach without any seeming surprise, but also with no peculiar pleasure. "'Where's he going?' Beric asked. She's an acquaintance of his, Mr. Wolf said dryly. 
Are we supposed to wait for him? He can catch up with us, Wolf replied. Mandorlin had stopped his horse near the woman and dismounted. He bowed to her and held out his hands to help her down from her horse. They walked together toward the ruin, not touching, but walking very close to each other. They stopped beneath the archway and talked. Behind the ruin, clouds raced in the windy sky, and their enormous shadows swept uncaring across the mournful fields of Arendia. We should have taken a different route, Wolf said. I wasn't thinking, I guess. Is there some problem? Dernick asked. Nothing unusual in Arendia, Wolf answered. I suppose it's my fault. Sometimes I forget the kind of things that, that can happen to young people. Don't be cryptic, father, Aunt Paul told him. It's very irritating. Is this something we should know about? Wolf shrugged. It isn't any secret, he replied. Half of Arendia knows about it. A whole generation of Arendish virgins cry themselves to sleep every night over it. Father, Aunt Paul snapped exasperatedly. All right, Wolf said. When Madorlin was about Garion's age, he showed a great deal of promise. Strong, courageous, not too bright. The qualities that make a good knight. His father asked me for advice. And I made arrangements for the young man to live for a while with the Baron of Vaux, Ebor. That's his castle back there. The Baron had an enormous reputation, and he provided Mandorlin with the kind of instruction he needed. Mandorlin and the Baron became almost like father and son, since the Baron was quite a bit older. Everything was going along fine until the Baron got married. His bride, however, was much younger, about Mandorlin's age. I think I see where this is going, Dernick remarked disapprovingly. Not exactly, Wolf disagreed. After the honeymoon, the Baron returned to his customary nightly pursuits and left a very bored young lady wandering about his castle. It's a situation with all kinds of interesting possibilities. Anyway, Mandorlin and the lady exchanged glances, then words, the usual sort of thing. It happens in Sindaria, too, Dernick observed. But I'm sure the name we have for it is different from the one they use here. His tone was critical, even offended. You're jumping to conclusions, Dernick, Wolf told him. Things never went any farther. It might have been better if they did. Adultery isn't really all that serious, and in time they'd have gotten bored with it. But since they both loved and respected the Baron too much to dishonor him, Mandorlin left the castle to things before things could get out of hand. Now they both suffer in silence. It's all very touching, but it seems like a waste of time to me. Of course, I'm older. You're older than everyone, father, Aunt Paul said. You didn't have to say that, Paul. Silk laughed sardonically. I'm glad to see that our stupendous friend at least has the bad taste to fall in love with another man's wife. His nobility was beginning to get rather cloying. Little old man's expression had that bitter self-mocking cast to it Garin had first seen in Val Alorn when they had spoken with Queen Perenne. Does the Baron know about it? Dernick asked. Naturally, Wolf replied. That's part the part that makes the Arends get all mushy inside about it. There was a knight once, stupider than most Arends, who made a bad joke about it. The Baron promptly challenged him and ran a lance through him during the duel. Since then, very few people have found the situation humorous. It's still disgraceful, Dernick said. Their behavior is above reproach, Dernick, Aunt Paul maintained firmly. There's no shame in it as long as it doesn't go any further. Decent people don't allow it to happen in the first place, Dernick asserted. You'll never convince her, Dernick. Mr. Wolf told the smith. Polgaris spent too many years associating with the Wasite errands. There were as they were as bad or worse than the Mimbrates. You can't wallow in that kind of sentimentality for that long without some of it rubbing off. Fortunately, it hadn't totally blotted out her good sense. She's only occasionally girlish and gushy. If you can avoid her during those seizures, it's almost as if there was nothing wrong with her. My time was spent a little more usefully than yours, father, Aunt Paul observed acidly. As I remember, 
you spent those years carousing in the waterfront dives in Kamar. And then there was the uplifting period you spent amusing the depraved women of Maragor. I'm certain those experiences broadened your concept of morality enormously. Mr. Wolf coughed uncomfortably and looked away. Behind them, Mandorlin had remounted and begun to gallop back down the hill. The lady stood in the archway with her red cloak billowing in the wind, watching him as he rode away. They were five days on the road before they reached the river Arend, the boundary between Arendia and Talnidra. The weather improved as they moved farther south, and by the morning, when they reached the hill overlooking the river, it was almost warm. The sun was very bright, and a few fleecy clouds raced overhead in the fresh breeze. The high road to Vaux Mimber breaches to the left just there, Mandorlin remarked. Yes, Wolf said. Let's go down into the grove near the river and make ourselves a little more presentable. Appearances are very important in Vaux Mimber, and we don't want to arrive looking like vagabonds. Three brown-robed and hooded figures stood humbly at the crossroads, their faces down and their hands held out in supplication. Mr. Wolf reined in his horse and approached them. He spoke with them briefly and then gave each a coin. Who are they? Garen asked. Monks from Mar Terren, Silk replied. What's that? It's a monastery in southeastern Talnidra where Maragor used to be, Silk told him. The monks try to comfort the spirits of the Marags. Mr. Wolf motioned to them and they rode on past the three humble figures at the roadside. They say that no Murgos have passed here in the last two weeks. Are you sure you can believe them? Hatter asked. Probably. The monks won't lie to anybody. Then they'll tell anybody who comes by that we've passed here. Wolf nodded. They'll answer any question anybody puts to them. That's an unsavory habit, Beric grunted darkly. Mr. Wolf shrugged and led the way among the two trees beside the river. This ought to do, he decided, dismounting in a grassy glade. He waited while the others climbed down from their horses. All right, he told them. We're going to Vaux Mimber. I want you all to be careful about what you say there. Memberates are very touchy, and the slightest word can be taken as an insult. I think you should wear your white robe Furlag gave you, father, Aunt Paul interrupted, pulling open one of the packs. Please, Paul, Wolf said. I'm trying to explain something. They heard you, father. You tend to belabor things too much. She held up the white robe and looked at it critically. You should have folded it more carefully. You wrinkled it. I'm not going to wear that thing, he declared flatly. Yes, you are, father, she told him sweetly. We might have to argue about it for an hour or two, but you'll wind up wearing it in the end anyway. Why not just save yourself all the time and aggravation? It's silly, he complained. Lots of things are silly, father. I know the errands better than you do. You'll get more respect if you look the part. Mandorlin and Hedar and Beric will wear their armor. Dernick and Silk and Garion will wear their doublets Furlak gave them to Incendar. I'll wear my blue gown, and you'll wear the white robe. I insist, father. You what? Now listen here, Polgara. Be still, father, she said absently, examining Garion's blue doublet. Wolf's face darkened and his eyes bulged dangerously. Was there something else? she asked with a level gaze. Mr. Wolf let it drop. He's as wise as they say he is, Silk observed. An hour later, they were on the high road to Vaux Mimber under a sunny sky. Mandorlin, once again in full armor and with a blue and silver pennon streaming from the tip of his lance, led the way with Beric in his gleaming mail shirt and black bearskin cape riding immediately behind him. At Aunt Paul's insistence, the big Cherik had combed the tangles out of his red beard and even rebraided his hair. Mr. Wolf, in his white robe, rode sourly, muttering to himself, and Aunt Paul sat her horse demurely at his side, in a short fur-lined cape, and with a blue satin headdress surmounting the heavy mass of her dark hair. Garion and Dernick were ill at ease in their finery, but Silk wore his doublet and black velvet cap with a kind of exuberant flair. 
Header's sole concession to formality had been the replacement of a ring of beaten silver for the leather thong which usually caught in his scalp's lock. The serfs, and even the occasional knight they encountered along the way, stood aside and saluted respectfully. The day was warm, the road was good, and their horses were strong. By mid-afternoon, they crested a high hill overlooking the plain, which sloped down to the gates of Vomimber.